Oh, that's why he will around here, treated like a god. I mean, I'll never find out what he could really do. I don't want this to be the high point of his life. I've seen him, the real sad ones. They sit around the rest of their lives talking about the glory days when they were 17 years old. You know, most people would kill to be treated like a god just for a few moments. Okay, Coach Hoover, the last we uh, ended in speaking with you, <clears throat> you had arrived at Kankakee, Kankakee Valley. What was the experience of coaching like at Kankakee? And I'm, I'm, I'm imagining this is where you get the idea of uh, starting basketball camps, or is this a little bit later when you go to St. Joseph's? No, it's, it's uh, I, got, I got the idea of the camps. Um, while I was at while I was at Kanky Valley, but um, when I, I went to Kanky Valley, and uh, basically because it was a little bit closer to my mother, and um, my mother, um, all men think that their mothers are saints. Mine was. Uh, my father died when I was. Um, in the eighth grade, uh, she was probably 30, she's probably 38 years old. And, um, my brother was a, uh, had fell off of a stepladder when he was two years old, fractured his skull, and he was a lifelong epileptic. And so she, uh, never paid, never went out, never, uh, looked at another man. She just took care of my brother and I. And, um, uh, she's just a wonderful woman. And so anyway, my brother got killed on a, uh, he was working on the state highway and he got killed in an accident and, uh, so I just, at that point, wanted to get a little bit closer to Monticello, and uh, I'd been offered a four-year contract in Monrovia, and I li- they liked me a lot, and I liked them. And uh, but I I decided to go to Kentucky Valley, and I'm not to, I'm not sure that that was a very good decision on my part. Um, the school board wanted me, but the the uh, superintendent absolutely did not want me. And the principal and the athletic director didn't want me. And uh, so consequently, that's that's just a tough situation to get into. And then when we went there, we didn't have very much talent. I, uh, we, we were, uh, uh, in a situation where we had some seniors that couldn't play a lick and, and, uh, so I moved some younger kids up and, uh, that wasn't very politically, wasn't very, uh, popular and we lost our first seven games. And, uh, so that, uh, made the faculty happy, but it, it didn't, uh, it, you know, it just was a bad situation. And, uh, we, we lost the first seven games and then won the league that they were in. It wasn't a very good league, but we won the league. Then the next year, uh, some of these kids had matured and got better and, uh, the next year, we won the sectional and uh, almost won a regional. We uh, just had a terrible call uh, uh, right at the end of the game. We had Lafayette. They'd won the Lafayette had won the uh, regional 27 straight times in a row, and we had them down. And uh, on a block and charge call, we just didn't get the call, and. Uh, the film later just showed that the kid had it. So we get beat. We had the ball in the air to beat Lafayette Jeff in the regional final. And uh, 
five out of the ten guys that I had on that team got money, that I graduated got money, and uh, uh, the next year we just didn't have any guards. Uh, Kanky Valley is a place where there's a whole bunch of Hollanders there. They call them Dutchmen, but they're they're from Holland, and they're exceptionally tall people. And uh, 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 give you some idea, there's some oh probably a thousand kids running around the place. That's 500 boys, and there's at least 25 boys running around the school that are six five, six six, six seven. It just ought to really be a factory for fours, um, uh, stretch stretch fives and uh, fours for uh, division two and three, and uh, so it's a, it's a, they got a lot of talent, but it's it's just not a, a real good situation. I uh, they call me in at Christmas. <laughs> After winning the sectional, they called me in at Christmas and fired me. So, and we were uh, three and four when they fired me. So it was a uh, just a political situation, it wasn't very good. And so that's when uh, I had a radio program with Bill Hogan, who was the athletic director and basketball coach at St. Joe, and. Uh, we got done with the radio program on Saturday morning, and I said, Bill, they're going to fire me on Thursday night. And he said, well, Jerry, when they fire you on Thursday night, I'll hire you on Friday morning. So uh, I went to work for St. John and continued to teach at uh, Kentucky Valley. So I was, uh, you know, a, a part-time coach at St. Joe for 11 years, and that's when we got the camp going. And that was a was that a dare from what I have heard? I'm sorry, say that again. Uh, was that kind of a did someone dare you to start these camps? Is that is is that the, the story that I've heard? Well, we were on the radio program, and uh, 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 he had. Uh, the, the uh, full-time assistant was also on the program, and and so I can't even remember his name now. But anyway, uh, he and uh, Hogan and he did a lot of the talking, and I just kind of sat around there. And so that morning it was really bad, and uh, they were talking about the camps they were running at St. Joe College. And uh, so finally got back to me, and he said, but Jerry, you were at Indiana State. He said, what? Um, what about your camp, sir? And I said, well, it was a good way for me to make $8,000 and Shell House to make 32000 And uh, he, he, he said, we'll be right back after this. <laughs> so as soon as they went to commercial, he said, what in the hell are you talking about? And I said, uh, uh, well, it's a moneymaker for the for the head coach. That's where the camp is. Of course, he was head coach, and he wasn't making any money off his camp. So he said, we got to talk. So we went down to a little coffee shop in Rensselaer, and he said, what are, you, what are we doing wrong with our camps? And I said, everything. I mean, they had, they, they had terrible... Uh, uh, he and the assistant were both from Ohio, so they didn't know anybody from Indiana. And then they didn't publicize it very well, and the brochures were just hand-printed things. And so they just didn't do a very good job of anything. And so um, uh, he, we started out with me getting 10% and him getting 90 And uh, the first year, uh, uh, we did it right. And the first year... Uh, it was a, I don't know, it was long about, I suppose, December, because I remember exactly they had a radiator in the hall at uh, St. Joe to the entrance of the field house, and uh, uh, Hogan, I was warming my fanny on that radiator, and uh, Hogan came up and 
got real close to me, and he said, uh, uh, you got $400? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, give it to me because that's what we lost this year. <laughs> so so I gave him 400 but then after that we started making a little money on the thing. And uh, I, my percentage increased. And then when he left and went to, he got the uh, athletic director's job at uh, University of San Francisco. So when he went, when he took that job, uh, he just left me to camp. And so then I just took it from there. And uh, I've had a, a guy that helped me from the very beginning, uh, Aaron Gadbury. And uh, so he's still with me, and, uh, you know, we're still running the things. Now, while you were at St. Joe, were there other opportunities to uh, coach high school basketball that came to you, and you just sit and take them, and you liked where you were at and with the camps, or how did that work out? I'm sorry, say that again. Uh, when you were at St. Joe as a uh, assistant coach or volunteer assistant coach and you were doing the camps, did you have other opportunities to take other coaching jobs in Indiana, but you didn't just because of the way the camps and the way you liked Rensselaer, Indiana? No, no, I kind of, I think it was a two-way street. I don't think very many people wanted to, would or wanted to hire me. And, uh, the other thing is, I was, you know, I was happy there. I, I, I like, I like the college game. I, the, the college game is, and I call it pure, because you don't have to. The only thing you have to worry about is just uh, X's and O's. You don't. The parents aren't involved. Uh, you don't have uh, a school board involved. Uh, you know, in a Catholic school, uh, the president. You might see him on game nights uh, four times a year, and um, it's just a lot. It's just a it's just a easier situation as far as uh, being a student of basketball and just working with basketball. So I liked it all right, and then the the camps were making a little bit of money and doing well, so it kept my mind busy. What was it like teaching at a school? And not coaching, you know, you're teaching at Kankakee Valley, but what's it like to, you know, and then go to Rensselaer to coach basketball? What's it like to, to teach and not be able to coach at a place that you're teaching? Well, it's not too bad. I, uh, uh, the night that I got fired, uh, the uh, superintendent, who didn't like me, he he just absolutely did not like me and and uh so he he said uh well Jerry and then he looked up he was looking me right in the eye and then he looked up as though he was getting some spiritual guidance from something <laughs> above him and he said uh, you just have to realize that the game has passed you by now that was 32 years ago. And since then, you know, I've coached 11 years at St. Joe, coached the girls at Logosport for 12 years. I've been coached a year four or five times. Uh, uh, I was North Central Conference coach of the year uh, four, three or four times. And so, you know, but that. Uh, the game has passed you by. And, uh, so that stuck in my call. And, uh, I didn't like the guys anyway, so I was teaching government. And as soon as I got on tenure, then I started going to the school board meetings and taking kids because there wasn't, it's an isolated community and so there wasn't any, you couldn't go to a, county council or to the city council or to, you know, other political events because they were uh, basically uh, 20 miles away. So I started going to school board meetings. And uh, I went for for 11 years. I didn't miss any. And uh, I, uh, if you put Oh, I don't know. If you put anywhere from two to thirty 
high school seniors in a room with uh, at a school board meeting, and they're talking about the education which those kids are experiencing. Uh, it it gives the kids a chance to speak up about what they. There's a difference between what the superintendent is telling the school board is happening and what the kids are really experiencing. And then, of course, you have disgruntled parents come in, and a lot of times the disgruntled parents have a a pretty uh, pretty good uh, point. And so uh, I just sat there, and uh, from time to time make comments and and uh, raise as much hell as I could. <laughs> and uh, they uh, it, it was uh, it was. Frankly, a three rank circus for you know on some nights, and, uh, but I had a, I really enjoyed that, and and uh, I was in a situation where they just about couldn't fire me, you know, as a teacher because I was uh, the they had an award there for the best teacher in the high school, and I won it three years in a row. Then they discontinued the award, <laughs> but. but uh, but then they had a little bitty newspaper, and uh, it was just a, a, a weekly newspaper. But that guy came to all the school board meetings, and uh, of course I, I, uh, you know, with my comments and the students' comments and everything that that sold that paper, <laughs> and, uh, and so that was just about the position where they where they. They didn't like me, but they couldn't fire me. And uh, so I, I did that for, I don't know, until I left there. And uh, I enjoyed that part of it because it was uh, there was a lot of learning went on for the kids. But there was, a, you know, I, I got even with that <laughs> guy saying, you know, that the game had passed me by and blah, 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 blah. Coach, what what was it like switching over to girls basketball? Tell us a little bit how that happens. Well, a lot of people have asked me that, and I can tell you this: first of all, I, I was assistant coach for three years. I was assistant coach for girls at Andrea, and um, I got that job. I, I did that job basically just because there wasn't. Any, any, it just didn't work out. The, the, uh, I was going to go to Andrean and be with Clint Swan, who was a coach there, and he had coached. Uh, he'd been on our team at St. Joe, and uh, then uh, really a good coach. And he got the Andrean job, and so we agreed that I'd go up there and teach shooting. And uh, but I couldn't get there. And I, I'd get there just at the end of practice, you know, like 20 minutes left. Well, you don't teach shooting at the last 20 minutes of a practice. You teach shooting uh, in the you right after warming up because uh, you want them. You teach it, and then uh, they do it uh, the rest of the practice. And so it wasn't working out very well. I, he was, Swan was happy enough with it, but it wasn't working out very well. And then the girls' coach, the guy named Ken Markville, who has since passed away, he kept saying, well, why don't you work for me? And uh, he kept asking me, he kept asking me, because the girls' practice was always after the boys' practice. And um, so I finally told him one night, I said, okay, I will do this, but I don't want you to pay me because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it, and I don't want any pay because I'm going to quit because I know I'm not going to like it. So I did it for a few days, and the girls uh, 
they would come around and say, hey, coach, help me with this. Coach, help me with that. Hey, coach, how about this? Coach, how about that? Well, I liked that because they wanted to learn. And uh, uh, so I I did that for three years. And the uh, and I was, of course, at that time, I started when I was 64 doing that. So I was 67. And that's pretty old to get a job in basketball in Indiana. And the Lotus for a job opened up. And then uh, Fisher, I knew Greg Fisher a little bit. And I called him up and I said, you know, I'd be interested in doing that Logan Sport thing. And he said, well, come down and we'll talk about it. So I went down to his kitchen and we sat there and talked one night and kind of got, got the agreement that I'd coach a, a coach the girls at Logan Sport. It was a good situation for me because it's just, they, they were losing. They uh, traditionally... They they had a guy that did a pretty good job, and uh, they were winning, you know, like 15 a year. And then he quit, and for about five or six years, they were awful. They just they just didn't have players, and they didn't have a program, and it was pretty bad. And so the situation from a bad, from a you know, what you need to do to have a good program. That situation I understood. And then because I had been with the uh, girls at Andran, I understand how you coach girls. And girls are a lot different than boys. Uh, I don't care what you say. I, and then through the camps, I knew a lot of girl coaches that were really good coaches. For instance, I think to this day she just quit, but I think Donna Cheatham is the best coach in Indiana. And uh, she just quit. I don't know how old she is. I think she's around 65, but she's won more games in Indiana than anybody else. Won two state champions, championships at two different schools. And had, if you can believe this, at a school the size of Scottsburg, she's had 54 Division One players. Oh, wow. It's unbelievable. 700 kids in high school had 54 Division One players. And so uh, I knew Jan Connor helped me a lot. She had won a couple of state championships in Martinsville. And so I knew good girls coaches over the state. So when I took the job, I, I was able to talk to them. Then the other thing, which was absolutely, absolutely the key thing that uh, led to getting off to a good start, uh, the assistant coach at Lotus Ward arranged a meeting for me to meet the girls at uh, a pizza joint. And I'll never forget, I walked into that pizza joint. I'm 67 years old. I'm looking at 16 and 17-year-old girls, and there was no question on their faces. I could see they were disappointed because I'm the wrong gender and I'm too old. So I went over to the superintendent, Jerry Thacker, and I, I said, uh, uh, I need your help. And he said, uh, well, what do you need? And uh, the guy, he's the best superintendent I ever worked for as far as money is concerned. I mean, he gets money for the school. He's, he's just an absolute wizard at it. And so uh, I said, well, Stephanie White, who, who, you know, played on Purdue's national championship team. She was playing for the Fever, and she and I was running camps together, and she was rehabbing. She had an ankle that was, it really was just splintered, and they had to put it back together piece by piece by piece, and so she was rehabbing for the whole uh, season for the women. And uh, 
I said, if I can get her to come to Logansport, that's just going to take some money. We can't just get her for three thirty-five hundred, four thousand dollars And he said, well, do what you got to do, and I'll give you the money. So, <laughs> so we put together a package where she uh, was by far the highest. She was the highest paid girls coach in Indiana, just between you and me. I mean, head <laughs> coach. She she made more money than anybody. And uh, but she is a wonderful person, and she did what I hoped would happen. She came in, and just because of her presence, the girls started acting like players. And uh, the seniors, they they didn't do very well. They they, you know. I'm not so sure they liked me, and I don't think they liked her because she she was way smarter than they were. And so it ended up, though, that the sophomores, there was a couple of sophomores that uh, really liked her, and they started following her around, and she's a kind of a, she's a natural leader. And so uh, she was there for one year, and she was the person that, uh, provided the conduit between a 67-year-old man and a 17-year-old girl. And she was able to, you know, they started, they started realizing what I was talking about and what she was talking about was the same thing. And so we got off to a pretty good, we didn't have good records. I think we won two the first year and one four the next year and one six the next year and one seven the next year. Then we won 15 and then, you know, after that we got, finally got so we were winning. We were winning in the low 20s every year. And, and, and along comes Whitney Jennings, correct? Well, see, Whitney didn't. Whitney was in the first grade when I went to Logansport. I was there twelve <laughs> years. She was in the first grade, and uh, everybody from the first day I saw her, I realized what I was looking at. But she was in the first grade, and she had a girl's ball, and the spin on it was right. She shot the ball, and the spin was right, and so. Then, uh, you know, I was 67, so that means then uh, I had to be 89 before, uh, or 79, I had to be 79 before she'd be a senior. So everybody thought, and I did, I didn't think I'd stay with it that long, but then I also had a girl the name of Jasmine Penny that was a uh, Indiana All Star and went to DePaul and was uh Big East uh, tournament player of the year and she was really a good player. So she came along and she helped us and then uh you know we started getting everybody at the all the last four years at Logan's Fort Anybody that wanted a scholarship could get a scholarship because we were that good. We were, we're, we're, we were really a nice basketball team. And, uh, so, uh, Whitney, uh, it's kind of an interesting story that, uh, everybody knew how good she was going to be, or at least thought they knew, and uh, 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 I was sitting in the athletic director's office one day, and uh, he said, uh, when she was in the seventh grade, we shut her off after she got 25. We told her, said, hey, when you get 25, you start passing. <laughs> <laughs> so she was getting 25 in the first quarter, and... Uh, she was passing for three quarters. So anyway, the athletic director said to me, he said, uh, what about this seventh grade girl he said I hear about? And I I looked him right in the eye and I said, Greg, I won't tell you what's going to happen. 
when she gets to the high school, you're going to be rolling out the bleachers upstairs in the very bowl. And he just laughed. He said, that'll never happen, who? That will never happen. Well, when she got there, we averaged about 3,500 at a game, and there were times when there was 5,000 in there. And, and uh, uh, girls' basketball made more money than any other sport, at Logan sport, except boys' basketball. We made more than football. We made more than, you know, any other sport, baseball, which is, is really important in Logan sport. So she was, uh, of course, an unusual player. And then <clears throat> because of my relationship with Mount, she worked, she worked the Mount camps, and then she worked, she played for Logan Sports team in the team camps. And she was playing, she started for us in the summer as a sixth grader on the varsity. And I, I never forget, we're playing somebody, I can't remember, but we're playing in the camp championship game and she's just, she's just going crazy. And the other coach, they had somebody trying to guard her and I, I to this day, I, she said, Melissa, She's only a freshman. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she's getting 25, 30 points every game. And she said that the senior couldn't guard her. And she said, Melissa, she's only a freshman. <laughs> so uh, she was, of course, you know, four years with her is just like four years with Luke. She just. She's a really good player, and uh, we're winning the North Central Conference. We're winning sectionals. We're winning regional. Uh, everything was just great. So. What What are the politics of an Indiana All Star and a Miss Basketball? Is that Is that something that is out there and prevalent, or is that something that's just a? Um, uh, well, is a, that that is a great question. That. That is a great question. And the big word that you mentioned is politics. There is absolutely no question of what, there's a lot of politics involved. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I, it was fortunate for me because I knew a lot of coaches. The coaches vote on the, uh, All Stars and the coaches vote on Miss Basketball. So I knew a lot of coaches and because she played in that camp that I ran, there was, a, there was you know, a hundred we're running I don't know, 125, 130 schools a year through that camp. There were an awful lot of coaches that knew her. Especially since she started since the sixth grade. <laughs> you know, she was a real little girl anyway. And then she'd be out there, and they'd all be licking their chops because they think they'd take the ball away from her. And the uh, next thing they're doing is clutching air, and she's laying it up. And uh, so everybody in the state pretty well knew about her. And then <clears throat> we did a lot of things for her. Uh, we played every place that, you know, there's, there's quote, unquote, markets in Indiana. And so we played we played two uh games in her junior and senior year we played at a thing called the Region Round Ball in uh the Civic Center and we played there. Uh we were in the uh uh, uh Hall of Fame game. Uh and then I took her around, of course, to every clinic that I could get somebody to let me talk. I'd take her in and just let her do her thing. She's very good with ball handling. She's very good shooter. And so I just let her do her thing. Her dad was, uh, uh, he is in the Hall of Fame yet, but he will be. And he, he's a, he was assistant coach, so he would, 
uh, go through her routine, her training routine, and I'd talk. And uh, so she had great exposure among the coaches who are the ones that vote for the all-star team in Indiana. And then uh, uh, Charlie Hall was the uh, director of the all-star team at that time, and he he came over one day to Logan's board and he said, Jerry, there was no use to... He said, I've never done this before, but he said, there's no use to uh, blow smoke. He said, she's, she's got like 150 votes, and the next person's got 30, so she's going to get it. He said, I'd like to go down and talk to her and get started on the All-Star team right now. And so we went down to her house and told her, and uh, so she just had great exposure. Did you also did you also use Coach uh, Coach Shellhouse was uh, at uh, Logan's Fort the same time you were for a little while too, right? Yeah, yeah. So you got to bounce off. Uh, you had a basketball mind uh, to bounce stuff off of. Well, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> See, Shellhouse is. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know that. that uh, I don't know that I've really spent much time talking about basketball with him, but I can tell you this: uh, if you're if you're uh, uptight about a game that you can talk to him, you won't be uptight after about five minutes, because he's he's a he he's a great uh, he's been in enough tight situations that he can get you he can get you loosened up in a hurry. So. Uh, from that standpoint, he is very valuable. Coach, during all of your career at, at, at coaching, what was your, what was you, how was Coach Hoover with the officiating? Did you just let it roll? Did you like to give officials a hard time when they would make bad calls? I mean, no, I how didn't. did you handle I, I think I got, I never worried about it much. See, I refereed myself for five years from the time that I got out of the Army. Until I started coaching, I, I refereed for five years myself. And so <clears throat> I pretty much understood a little bit about how a referee feels and how it is to be an official. And so I think I've, I think, I think I've only had seven texts in, uh, you know, 50 some years of coaching. And, uh, I don't, I don't bother with them if they really, um, if they really uh, take advantage of a player. It really bothers me. I got thrown out of one game, and I was we were in Monticello playing in a holiday tournament, and Jasmine Penny was playing for us, and she was all star, and uh, uh, there was an Oriental referee. Who was, you know, I suppose a grad student at Purdue or something. I know he's from West Lafayette. And, uh, she was around the front playing the post person and he called her for that. And so I raised really hell with him. And then, uh, uh, we came out at half and, uh, she was around in front again. And uh, he made the same call, and it was a terrible call. I got it on tape and everything. So he threw me out, and uh, I, I really was upset and angry with that guy. And I can't, oh, I suppose a couple other guys I can remember being angry with, but mostly I just, uh, uh, you know, question them, ask them what they saw, and they tell me what they saw, and I tell them what I saw. And, and, you know, of course, I always lose, but it's it's fun. So I never get I never get very many, uh, or never had very many texts. Coach, uh, <clears throat> your son gave me a title of a story. It's called "Give Me a Second. Do you recall that story? The what? It's called "Give Me a Give Me a Second. Oh yeah, I remember that. Can you share it with us? We, 
We were at Calumet. This is I was coaching boys, and it was at Calumet. Calumet's got, uh, oh, I don't know, 7,000 seats, I suppose. And uh, we were in the sectional. I was coaching at Lake Central. And uh, so we come out there, and this guy was standing there. I'd never seen him before. And uh, so I was talking to him. He was the referee, and he said, boy, this is really something. And we were playing the first game the first night. And there was about 4,000 in there. And I said, uh, well, you know, this thing will be full before it's over. He said, you got to be kidding me. And I said, well, where did you work before? And he said, well, I'm from Wisconsin. So he said, I've never worked a Indiana high school tournament before. And I said, well, you're in for it because you think there's enough people in here now. You know, he said something like this, the most people I've ever seen in the gym. And I said, well, it just hang on for about a half hour because you're going to sit there going to be parked in the core corners. So the game the went ahead to the tournament and he had the final game of the tournament and we're playing Calumet and uh with about two minutes to go, it's a two point ball game and he missed a call. He he absolutely missed a call. And uh on an out of bounds play. And so I went over there and his name was Charlie and I said, Charlie, are you sure and he said, no, I missed it. And so I said, well, Charlie, you know, this is pretty damn important around here. And I said, what are you going to do about it? He said, give me a minute. <laughs> so help me God, the battalion, that guy just did one ball up the floor, and he just blew his whistle and took the ball away from him. They <laughs> give it to us. Call him for a travel. So I never forgot that, of course. So the next year I was at Ben Davis, and we're at Lebanon. And I come out for the game, and there's Charlie. <laughs> He's got the game. And uh, Lebanon was number two in the state, and we were eight and eight. It was my first year. We were eight and eight. So Ed, Brian Walker was playing for Lebanon, and Rosenthal. He just did this. I mean, everybody in the state knew he didn't. But with a two-man crew, two referees, he would have his team. After if there's a foul on the other end, he would have his team figure eight and bump into one another and so forth and so on. And then when you got down to the foul line, Rick Mount always shot the free throws. And Brian Walker always shot the free throws. It didn't make any difference who got fouled. Uh, Mount and Walker, or the bad designated free throw shooter, and they would weave around like drunk men and get down there and shoot the free throws. Well, they've done that all night long. Walker was shooting the free throws, and uh, so got down to the end of the game, and it was a two point ball game, and uh, uh. We fouled, I remember, the. I think it was number 24. We fouled him over in the corner. <clears throat> and by the time Lebanon and went through the bumping into one another and so forth, there was Walker up there ready to shoot another free throw. So I just ran out there, and when the referee, Charlie, had the ball, and he gave it, to, gave it to him, I just took the ball away from him, and I said, he is not going to shoot this one. <laughs> so he teched me. And uh, so I ran over to the I ran over to the score and jerked him. I was you know I'm six six and I jerked him out of the out of his seat. And I said it was twenty four and it wasn't ten. And he said uh, he was scared, you know. And he said you're right. So then I got Charlie over there and I said now Charlie, they've been doing this all night and you haven't seen it. But I said, he's admitted that the wrong guy to shoot the free throw. So now they go out, Charlie says, well, just a minute. So there's some guy from 
Greencastle had the game with him. And so they go out in the middle of the floor, and you know how they do. They put their hand up over their mouth, and they're talking to one another. And meanwhile, there's 5,000 in there at Lebanon throwing popcorn boxes and everything on the floor, and they're madder than hell. And, and, and uh, Janet is out there sweeping up the floor. Charlie's talking to him. Father comes over there and he says, Gary, he said, we can't pick him because we didn't, he didn't actually get the ball because you grabbed the damn ball. So he, he, so he, he didn't really, we can't pick him, but we got to pick you because you was out on the floor. And he said, uh, that's just the way it's going to be. And I said, well, Charlie, you know, this is pretty important. And it isn't right because they didn't do it all night long. It's just because he didn't actually touch the ball. Two rights don't, the two wrongs don't make a right. So he said, give me a minute. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know what happened. 24, he shot and missed, and we got the ball back and and uh, got down. We're we're uh, it's still a two point ball game, and we ran a play, and uh, a guy named a Buck Rob split him and uh, shot a little shot, shot a little shot, you know, about about. 12 feet, right, right straight on, knocked it down. He got fouled. And some kid over in the corner from Lebanon said, oh, shit. And Charlie rang him up. He <laughs> called a check on him. <laughs> so now we're shooting free throws, you know, with about 30 seconds to go. Hell, we're, we're, we made the basket that tight. It, I was going to shoot a free throw because he got fouled on the shot. And then uh, we go up there and Whitman was shooting the, the two tanks, so he never missed. So we get So the rubbing and crowd, what they're looking at is Ben Davis shooting free throws, see? And they're bad. I mean, they are bad. And so we, we went ahead and won the ball game. Well, I'm going to the locker room. I'm pretty happy to see the number two team in the state. And uh, they're, they're, they're throwing quarters and nickels and stuff at us. they bouncing them off the bleachers as we're going to the locker room. So we get to the locker room, and I remember I just sat down, and I was just happy, you know. And kids were just sitting around just kind of relaxing for the fifth tower, and in comes the chief of police. And he said, now, Coach, he said, we're going to get you out of here. But he said, there's a whole lot of pissed off people out there. <laughs> and he said, uh, so you just take your time, get in the shower. And he said, uh, we're going to get a couple of backups up here. And he said, we're going to get you, we're going to get you out of here. Don't worry about it. So we got in the bus and the Chief police got in the front of the bus. He said, now, boys, get down underneath. He said, get, get your heads down. And he said, uh, we got police here to help you. And so we go right down through the middle of Lebanon with a police car in front of us, a police car behind us with the red lights on. And we got out to 65 and, and then went on back to Ben Davis. But that's a give me a minute story, you know. <laughs> Coach, while you were at Logansport, and how many times in your career have you thought of, you know, retiring from coaching? And take us to Blackford with that question. Well, uh, I didn't really, I really wasn't going to quit at Logansport. I, uh, Whitney was gone, but but we had we had three Division One players. Now, that's pretty good for girls, and then we had. A Division Two player, a freshman. That was a Division Two player that we had. Uh, Nakia Penny was already signed at Ball State, and then I had a girl that uh, uh, 
Villanova was looking at, and uh, she could play. And then we had a we had a uh, sophomore that's the best girl feeder, including Whitney, that I coached. She really could flat out shoot. And so you know we had players, and in my mind, I was hoping to have the first girls team in Indiana that were all jump shooters. See that most girls want to do what we call toe it and just slide the foot and not jump up in the air and shoot jump shots. And uh, so we really had a nice team there. And we went to camp and uh, they just weren't doing what I wanted. They're just jacking around. And I got them together. I don't. I don't believe in telling people twice what I got on my mind. And so I got them together, and I said, "Hey, if you guys don't get better, uh, you you got to get better. I mean, we're, we're gonna we got to be really good here without Whitney Jennings, and you got to get pick it up. And uh, next thing I didn't. So I just." Got him together and I said, Hey, what you guys need is another coach. And they cried and went, All of them was mad at me. And then their daddies were mad at me. And, but I just, it wasn't a matter. I just said, Hey, when you can't be effective, if, you, if you're in an organization and you're not the, an effective leader anymore, you need to get out of Dodge. And so that's what I did. And, and how does more? How does Blackford come around? I'm sorry, say that again. And, and how does the where you're at currently? How does that come around? How do I get to what? How, I, I didn't get that. How do you get to uh, coaching where you're at now? Blackford? Yes. Well, you know, I'm 82 years old. <laughs> <laughs> And I tell everybody, it's hard to get a job when you're 82. I don't care how good of credentials you got and everything. And uh, uh, I really tried the year before. I I put I sent resumes and all that stuff because uh, Luke's dad, Ted, is my cousin, and Ted Ted's daddy. Jerry and I were cousins, and we played together at Monticello. And Ted and my son Don played on the first sectional championship at Twin Lake. And so we, these little kids at Old Christmas Thanksgiving, these little kids run around there, three, four years old, you know, and, and uh, we're, we're eating turkey and talking, and you know, he said it'd be, be nice though, the right age, they could play together. Well, Ted said, finally, Ted said, listen, you get a job and I'll come. And Donnie was a professor at uh, uh, Kentucky, Western Kentucky, and he said, I'll come if I can get a job. We put the two of them together. So, first year, that was when, that's when Luke was done in the seventh grade. And see, he was homeschooled, so nobody knew how good he was. And I didn't know how good he was. I'd go to an AAU game and watch him, and I knew he was very, very intelligent basketball-wise. And that's the first thing you've got to do when you're a point guard. I knew he really had great basketball intelligence for, you know, Ellie, fifth grade. So anyway, uh, uh, I, the first year I, I went five places and interviewed. Of course, they ran me out because I was too old. And uh, uh, the, the one place I really wanted to go uh Jerry Brown got cancer. That's uh, my cousin that I played with. He got cancer, and uh, 
There's a little school here uh, about 10 miles from Monticello that opened up, and so I went over there and interviewed, and, and uh, I told them, uh, and they were awful. I mean, they were absolutely awful. And uh, I, I told them, I said, you know, next year I've seen your team, and you got them two freshmen, and I said, uh, uh, we'll win four or five games and figure out the league and figure out what's going on. And I said, we'll have about 400 in the game. I said, but won't this seventh grader get to town? It won't take all those four people to figure out who he is. And I said, you'll have about 15, 1,600 at a junior high game. Well, they just rolled their eyes, you know, and looked around. They thought I was blowing smoke. And uh, so the athletic director said, well, we can't bring a – he didn't tell me this, but he told one of the guys that was on the committee, and then he told me, he said, that he said that we can't bring some seventh grader in here from Brownsburg, you know. <laughs> so uh, I never got a job. I didn't really get a, get a, a chance at a job. So the next year, I just made up my mind, I'm not even going to send a resume and let them throw them through it and then call me. I'll just go to cold call them. Every time a job open within 100 miles of a or someplace where Ted will go, I'll just go and talk to them. And so I really had I had two jobs. I had we We had another job. But the, the athletic director just dilly dallied around and dilly dallied around and, and then the other thing was Ted didn't want to move to that town. But when Blackford, uh, when I got to Blackford and, and we got pretty serious about it, he, uh, because his daughter was at Ball State and, and Muncie is only 12 miles from Harper City. And he looked around and found a house or two that, that he that he liked. So, uh, you know, we just sat down one Sunday afternoon with the president of the school board and uh, hammered out a deal where a four-year contract where if I died or got had a stroke or heart attack, I'd gone and take it over and so uh, basically, that's uh, that's how it came about. It wasn't I I I cold called uh, Blackford. If I would have if I would have sent a resume in, they'd have they'd have thrown it uh, in the waste paper basket. But you know, once they figured out what we were talking about, and they were desperate. I mean, they'd won one and lost seventy three. You got to work at it to do that. So um, that's how we ended up there. Uh, Coach, what was what was it like to finally get the phone call, or ever however you were notified that you were going to be inducted in the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame? Uh, well, in all honesty. You know, for 10 years, I didn't apply. McNulty tried to get me to apply, and uh, Bob King wanted me to apply, and the Shell House wanted me to apply, and I just didn't do it. I I don't know. I think I, in my own mind, I thought, well, I don't, I don't think I measure up. And uh, so then after uh, a while, I just, uh, there was a guy named Jim Paul at, uh, uh, Seymour called me up and he had been in school. He wasn't a player, but he'd been in school at Salem when I coached at Salem. And he lived next to Whitman, uh, in Florida or wherever Whitman lives. I don't know exactly where he lives, but I think in Florida. And uh, so he and Whitman, uh, 
said that I ought to be in the Hall of Fame. And when Whitman said I ought to be in, I just decided, well, uh, I, maybe I ought to do it. So I filled out the paperwork, and and um, and Tom Thomasley helped me get a couple of letters. Whitman wrote a letter. And I don't know who else wrote the letters, and and um, so. Uh, it was really 10 years where people were saying you ought to apply, but I never did. And then when Whitman and Plunk got a hold of it, then I did it. And uh, so I got in the first year. And uh, since then, I really enjoyed it. I didn't, you know, I didn't think much of it, but since then, it's kind of nice to be introduced as a member of the Hall of Fame. So it's, it's been nice for me. Coach, at your age and coaching, how do you keep your energy and your focus up? Well, it's the only thing I've ever done, the only thing I ever care about. And, and so that's, if you, unless I'm dead, well, I'm going to be thinking about it. So, <laughs> uh, you know, that's what I do. It's if, like I tell everybody, Bear Bryant's my favorite coach of all time. Bear Bryant's my favorite coach. And he said, he said, the day I quit this, I'll croak in six months. And, and uh, I've got myself in a state that I think that's the case with me. The day I quit, well, I'll be dead. He was dead in three weeks, and I think I'll, I'll be dead in six months. Coach, how does it feel with, with most of the people that I've uh, talked to or have seen or have uh, conversed about interviewing you that – most have said that you are a great coach, and, of course, you're in the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame, but you're even a greater teacher. How does that make you feel? What, a teacher? Yes, a greater teacher. So great that, coach, but a greater teacher. I am. <laughs> because I like better. I like, I like teaching better than I do coaching. I love, I love teaching. I taught government for 40 years, and... Uh, you know, I'm really proud of that. I, I, uh, my, I, I got to, my classes shook hands with every president from Eisenhower to Clinton, except Kennedy and uh, Reagan. I mean, I got them in the same room with them, and uh, somebody in that class that I had in there got up there and shook hands with the President of the United States. And I took, I took a hundred kids out to. To New Hampshire for a week, a hundred kids from seven high schools to New Hampshire for a week and campaign for Luger out there, you know, with 10 below zero knocking on doors. And, uh, uh, I really had a good, I really had a great relationship and we had, we had the best government that I taught, the best Results I had was when I was at Kansas Valley teaching government, and uh, the uh, Jasper County doesn't have a very strong Democratic Party. So the Republican chairman I got to know him, and uh, you know everything that came up why uh, we were in on it. If uh, uh, Luger came to town, if Luger came to Jasper County. Why, uh, they're always, they're either going to have a hog roast or pork chops or chicken. And, uh, Kenny Culp was the chairman. He called me up and he said, Jerry, he said, we're a little short. He said, uh, we need, going to have, uh, the congressman in tomorrow night. Going to be at the fairgrounds. We're going to eat chicken. And he said, uh, we're a little short of, of a crowd, he said, uh, we'd like to have you give as many as you can. So I'd go back and then I said, well, how many do you need, Kenny? And he said, well, could you get 100? And I said, I'll get 100 there. And so i go back in that classroom and you know, and look at the grade book and say, listen, some of you guys are going to be taking this over again if you don't get some extra credit. <laughs> and I got some extra credit for you, plus some chicken. Plus some chicken, and plus you got to shake hands with the United States Congressman, you know. And so, 
<laughs> They'd all get in the cars and drive down there and take hands with the congressman, which would be five points, and eat chicken, which would be ten points. <laughs> <I'd> see that. <laughs> then, <laughs> then this Kenny Culp, he was a piece of work. He'd get up there every, every Republican meeting, you know. I'd have kids there, and I'd go myself, and... He'd, he'd get up there with a canned speech, but he'd say, well, once again, he said, we see Jerry Hoover's got his government class here. And he, said, uh, he said, I want to tell you something. My God, if everybody in uh, Indiana would get their participation at their government classes that Hoover does, we wouldn't have this voter apathy that we have from 18 to 26. <laughs> He said, before Hoover got to Kankakee Valley, he said we were getting about 16% voting percentage out of the 18 to 26 year group. Since he's been there, it's 80 cents. You know, man. He'd go on and on. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I just like, I like teaching better than I do, do coach, and I, I just, uh, Coaching is teaching. Coaching is teaching. Right. And then, uh, I, I knew Knight a little bit. And uh, all that cussing and swearing and raising hell and so forth and so on, I'll tell you right now, all he was doing that for was just get him to, to do what he wanted to do, which is what teaching is. And, uh, uh, I tell everybody that, hell, uh, he, 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 I don't know if he's the best teacher I ever saw, but I guarantee you he's one of them. Great teacher. Coach Hoover, thank you so much. This will be, uh, like I was saying earlier, this was well-received, your first uh, interview. This will be well-received, your second one. I'm sorry that we went a little long. I wish you luck on, on the upcoming season if there is one. No, hopefully. Sorry. And you this could. was fantastic. I'm... Okay, I enjoyed doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. Yep.